Thank you for joining December 2022 edition of 3M Healthcare Academy. Our topic today is design, function, and application of process challenge devices. I am Fernando Malgueiro, Medical Education Manager for 3M Medical Solutions Division, and I will be hosting this webinar. Before we get started, let's go to the following disclaimers. The content of this webinar is based on current United States information, including regulations, standards, and practice as of September 1st, 2022. Requirements in other countries may be different and US guidance may change in the future. Always consult product instructions for use and follow local laws and regulations. These presentations contain an overview of general information and should not be relied upon in isolation to make specific decisions. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Paulo Laranjeira. Dr. Laranjeira has 25 years of experience as a process development and qualification professional for sterilization, using saturated steam, hydrogen peroxide, and ethylene oxide in the pharmaceutical, medical device, and healthcare areas. He conducted many investigations with biological and chemical indicators and with different sterile barrier systems, with the findings published in journals. He has authored book chapters, technical documents, and white papers on topics related to sterilization and decontamination processes. Dr. Laranjeira is currently a full-time contractor with the US FDA and invited professor at postgraduate schools on equipment qualification and monitoring for the pharmaceutical and healthcare market. He has also shared his knowledge by lecturing in Congress and symposiums. With that, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Paulo Laranjeira. Please take it away. Thank you, Fernando. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Trigam, for inviting me to do this uh, webinar. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here again with you guys. Today, uh, we'll be talking about process challenge devices, uh, how we should use it, how are they meant to be used, and some critical points uh, that we need to observe. So today I'm going to start discussing the sterilization, steam sterilization cycle uh, and what are the variables and of the cycle and what we need as a steam quality uh, in the chamber. Also, uh, we'll explain how quality indicators perform or how they react to these variables during the cycle. And then explain process challenge device results in comparison to the load. Because keep in mind that we are using this process challenge device, this PCD, um, inside of a, the chamber that has our load in there. And what does that PCD tell us in relate, as related to the load? Okay? So now let's look into the steam sterilization cycle per se. First, um, we have that a uh, healthcare device is considered sterile if it was in an adequate condition of sterilization. And I'm using that term because we have steam dryness. So we need to have time and temperature to sterilize, but also this sterlet, in this case, steam, has to have a quality that is adequate to sterilize my medical device. And after the sterilization cycle, I must have reached a minimal reduction of 12 logs inside of my load. Looking to the equipment that we have today and what we have in our sterilizer, and this drawing was done uh, on an old model, 
that we see here, but it uh, still applies today. Most of the sterilizers, the grand total of the sterilizers that we have today, almost 100% of them will have a sensor, a temperature sensor on the drain. You have a pressure sensor on the uh, chamber, internal chamber. Some sterilizers might have additional uh, pressure sensors and also additional temperature sensors. But for us, in the uh, analysis of the cycle, we are going to use, you know, we are going to look into the sensors that really control the cycle. So let's look into the temperature sensor. The temperature sensor is placed normally inside of the drain. It's not inside of the chamber, but it is at the drain in a position that is going to be measuring the temperature passing through the drain. So when steam goes inside of the chamber, right, and gets in contact with the medical devices, it will condensate. And this condensate is what is going to come out through the drain. So the temperature sensor is actually measuring the lowest temperature inside of the chamber. That's why you see in the literature that the sensor is placed in the coldest spot of the chamber. Not 100% of the time, but most of the time it is the coldest spot inside of the chamber. Now, the pressure transducer can be placed anywhere in the chamber because it is measuring what we have as pressure inside of the chamber. So during the cycle, we are going to have the equipment controlling in the conditioning phase is going to be controlling basically the pressure. So it's going to monitor the vacuum that is done, then steam inject. So all of those values are pressure based. Once it reaches this point and it starts going up to the exposure phase, when it reaches the, initial, the beginning of the exposure phase, then temperature is the main control. Pressure is being monitored, but then I start controlling the temperature because I cannot have a temperature variation during exposure. <clears throat> and then I'm going to control time all the way to the end of the exposure phase. At the end of the exposure phase, again, I switch back to the pressure transducer and the pressure transducer is going to monitor the vacuum that is being pulled inside of the chamber to remove all the steam and all the condensate that is going to be vaporized during this drying process. Let's take into let's look into a uh, let's take it to uh, deep dive into the requirements of the exposure phase. So, at the exposure phase, we have a requirement to reach a temperature of 270 to 75. So, in this case, 275 for three minutes. These two requirements, dryness and non-condensed gases, those requirements are listed in the standard. They should be measured when the equipment is installed and in, in a, a frequent interval. We don't have that yet established. I believe um, the new revision of the standards will address this a little bit deeper. And that's why um, when Fernando did the initial um, introduction to this lecture, he mentioned that this presentation is based on current um, requirements, regulations, and standards. This is because the standards, they always go through a review process and uh, the systematic review normally occurs in a time frame of three to five years. But today, the only requirements that we have, and if you do equipment qualification, is going to be temperature and time 
dryness and non condensed gases, they are part of the equipment uh, operation. And normally they are done only in, during the installation of the equipment. Going a little bit deeper, looking to how we measure this. So um, temperature is going to be measured from my sensor. Let me go to the next slide. So temperature is going to be measured from my sensor in the drain. Pressure is going to be from the pressure transducer in the chamber. And time is going to be controlled by the controller. So I'm going to have on my physical indicator, on my printout, I'm going to have the values of time, temperature, and pressure. And I'm going to have that being recorded throughout the cycle. Now, I do not have, during this process, nothing related to dryness and non condensed gases. So when the cycle, when the equipment runs the cycle, when um, it is controlling the exposure phase, especially the exposure phase, it is relating the information that is capturing from the sensor in the drain and the pressure transducer in the chamber and making a comparison to a table that is published in the standard. Unfortunately, we do not have a measurement in our packages, in our medical devices. And we have different temperature or different pressure and temperature relationship inside of the package because of non condensed gases that are not measured and also the dryness. The dryness, we might have a dry steam, but if I have a load that is too heavy, for instance, or it has non-metallic devices, it will cause more condensation. And when we have more condensation, that value is not measured because it's only going to condensate inside of the package. So we know today at the uh, standardization committees that this table is only valid for a static cycle, but as you look deeper into what we process in a hostile sterilizer, this table might not be 100% current. That's why we have to have the process challenge devices. Those process challenge devices, they will help us uh, measure what the equipment cannot measure, which is dryness and non condensed gases. <clears throat> so let's take a look on the first critical item, which is residual air. And here I'm going to use a um, study that I did and was published in a peer reviewed journal, and I'm going to share it with you. And the idea here is to demonstrate how our monitoring devices or quality monitoring devices can be effective if they are used correctly. So the first one that everybody knows and uses is the BOIDIC. The BOIDIC is a test that was developed many, many years ago and is still valid today. And it's a great test that needs to be done daily daily. Uh, it's a test that will detect uh, the presence of air inside of the chamber that my equipment cannot detect. So here I have two cycles. If you look at it, both cycles are basically identical. I have the conditioning phase, I have the other conditioning phase, they have identical vacuum pulses. Um, the temperature is being reached at the same time. The come up curve is basically the same. So everything that you look into these graphs shows to you that these cycles are similar. Now, what I did during my research, I added on the cycle on the right, 
um, a little bit over a thousand milliliters of air inside of the chamber. So if you look into the chamber pressure, which is the green graph here, this green graph here, you're going to see that even if a controlled injection of air inside of the chamber, the pressure transducer was not able to detect that additional uh, air that was being added to the chamber. And this is because of a uh, law, it's called Dalton Law, that states that pressures are going to be added inside of a chamber. So the sensor is going to only be seeing the same result of the same pressure, even if it is steam, only steam or steam and air, at the end, it's going to be the same pressure. And the pressure transducer is only going to see the same pressure. That's why the Boydix is really important. So in this case, where I had on the right, air added during the cycle, the printout, and this is uh, where uh, it, it is important to see the boid deck. Let's look into the chemical. The chemical reaction of the boid deck showed to me that I had air inside of the main chamber. So this is the first evidence that we have to understand the conflict of information that we are seeing on our cycles. We are going to have a process channel device, which is a, uh, Boydick is a process channel device. It challenges the presence of, presence of air inside of the chamber. So it's going, to show us, it's going to show to us that we have air, even though, even though the printout, in other words, the physical indicator is showing that the cycle was perfect. I had the correct time, I had the correct temperature, I had the correct pressure. Everything in the printout was awesome, was everything was outstanding. But when I take out the PCD, the boy dick, and I remove uh, the chemical indicator, I see that that cycle was a failed cycle. So this is to show you to you that when we monitor a sterilization cycle, we need to understand that each indicator will be responsible for a group of information. You don't have one source of truth. We need to have all of them together showing and proved to have my cycle or to consider that cycle as a successful cycle. Now, my concern, and that's why I did this research, um, was on false positive results from my boy Dick. So I, I was in this in, in that period. I was visiting many hostels, and I was seeing a lot of discussions uh, where the boy Dick was showing a approved cycle on a failed cycle. And uh, unfortunately, we had uh, some instances where the user were not trusting the boy dick anymore. And I had to, to dig, no, do a, a, a deep dive to understand the root cause of that inconsistency with the boy dick and the presence of air. This is what I found. So here we have three different situations. We have in scenario one, a perfect cycle without air. So the boy dick and I used two different brands uh, to challenge uh, the hypothesis. And then on the second phase, I had air being injected into the chamber. So as you can see, both boy dicks detected the presence of air if a change of color. This one might not be 
as clear as um, as we see in real life because of the color and the, the quality of the uh, picture that was taken from the boy deck. But that one in the middle was a failed uh, boy deck cycle. And then on phase three, what I did, I had air being injected into the chamber, like phase two. But at this moment, instead of having a come up cor curve, right? What is the come up curve? Is the time, you know, or is the curve from the last vacuum point until the beginning of the exposure phase, right? So what I did, and this is what I found after uh, looking to 90, over 90 different sterilizers, I found out that the sterilizer, most of them, over 70% of them, had a really long come up curve. If you compare, let me clear this drawing. If you compare uh, the graph in the middle, if the one on the right, you're going to see that this curve here on the right is a little bit inclined. So it's showing you that it took a longer time to reach the exposure phase. By doing that, the excessive exposure to temperature, my chemical indicator in, on both boy dicks changed color. Even though we had air, and the air, and I'm going to show you in, in the slide in a little bit how air is trapped inside of the boy deck. Even though we had air inside of the chamber, because of the excessive temperature and these chemicals indicators here, they react to temperature. Because they have excessive time and temperature, it changed the color of the boy deck, even if the presence of air. And the reason for that is that when the boy dick is developed and tested, it follows a very specific standard. We have ISO 11140 part four and 11140 part five. And both standards, and I'm going to talk about part four that has more technical requirements. Both standards look into the come up curve as a continuous um, curve without any delays. And in my testing, up to three minutes of come up curve, the boy dick would have the current measurement result, but over three minutes, that come up curve was impacting on the boy dick uh, result, causing a failed, uh, causing a false negative result. So if you compare the reason, so we have here the standard for the boy dick, which has a very specific come up curve where they are tested. And then if you look into the standard used for um, equipment qualification, the, that standard of the queen only, only looks at the exposure phase. This is the exposure phase. It does not look into the come up curve. So what we are going to have is something that I'm showing here in this graph where you have the exposure phase being tested and being approved, but not looking to the come up curve. In this case, this come up curve, I, this, is, this was the worst case that I found. This come up curve had 13 minutes. It took 13 minutes from the last vacuum to the beginning of the exposure. So if you look into the pro sterilization process, we need three minutes at 275, right? I, if I have a come up curve of 13 minutes, there's no chemical indicator that is going to work in this sterilizer. Everything that you're going to read, no matter the manufacturer, no matter what type of indicator you're using, is always going to show a approved uh, cycle because of the excessive temperature, excessive exposure. Even though it is not the exposure phase per se, but it does have a lot of temperature during these 13 minutes. 
So this article was published. Uh, we discussed in the ISO meetings. Uh, I sent my recommendation. They are revising their meeting this week, actually. They are in uh, Arlington, Virginia, meeting uh, the working group three, that is, uh, no, working group, yeah, working group three, which is the steam sterilizer. They're meeting this week to go over the standard to see if this can be improved so we do not have a long come up curves. And then that will impact the result of my uh, boy dick. So just to give you a, a final draft or, or drawing of this uh, result, what I'm looking for is to have this um, come up curve standardized in the uh, sterilizer standard so it is equal or similar to the standard that uses uh, that is used to certify or to manufacture boy dick and test the boy dicks that we have in the market. Uh, then you, you might you might hear people saying that the come up curve you vary depending on the load, but for this case, as you know, boy dick is done in an empty chamber. So in an empty chamber, the come up curve has to be identical every single day because I don't have load impacting on how steam and condensate is going to behave inside of the chamber. So that's why we can add this requirement to the come up curve and standards um, should be revised to detect that. For you as a user today, what you need to look at it is that you have your printout, right? Look at the uh, the time that you had your last vacuum pulse done, and then the time that your exposure started. If that time is above three minutes, you're probably going to have a boy dick that will not be able to detect air or non condensed gases because of this excessive temperature. This is not a standardized. This is what I have today based on my research. If you go into the article, you're going to see that. So the maximum amount of time in the empty cycle for you to go from the last vacuum point to the beginning of the exposure, three minutes. The standard, if you look into the standard, if you do the math, is going to show 1.5 minutes, <clears throat> but uh, on the data that I have, the boy dick will still detect up to three minutes in the come up curve. All right, so that's the first one that we have. Now let's look into steam quality used for the sterilization of our devices. As I mentioned at the beginning, we today we only control time and temperature, right? And you have the pressure being um, printed also. But what we have is, did it reach temperature for how long, right? <clears throat> but we still have the steam dryness and non condensed gases that need to be monitored. How do we do that? So if you have a PCD inside of your chamber, that PCD will have on its exterior uh, area a temperature colder than steam. So in, when steam goes into the chamber, uh, let me change the color here. Um, yeah, so when steam goes into the chamber, right? So the red clouds are steam and it gets in contact with the, the surface of the PCD, what we are going to have as they get closer to the PCD, we are going to have condensation. So that cloud, that steam that got in contact with the surface is going to cool down. So I have a area reduction inside of the chamber. Since I cannot have vacuum, that area is going to be filled with more steam 
or if I have air inside of the chamber, that air is going to be drawn to that void that I have or that was caused by the condensation on the surface of the PCD. So air is going to be uh, brought closer to the PCD. Now, in this second, and as it goes through the sterilization uh, process, we are going to have a warmer area on the exterior, but we are still going to have a colder area. So steam is going to continue getting through the package and it's going to be condensating inside of the package to a point and drawing more air. When steam condensates, it reduces in volume. So I have a huge cloud of steam. When it condensates, it's going to be a drop of water. So when that happens, when I have that drop of water, the area that I had steam has to be filled with something. If I have only steam, steam is going to be is going to be drawn to that void. But if I have air, air is going to go to that void. That's why we are able to drag air into the PCD to the point that air is going to be concentrated inside of the PCD, and then we have the PCD monitoring non-condensed gases. So if I have non-condensed gases, which are gases that cannot condensate during the sterilization cycle, right? So if I have gases inside of the PCD and I have my chemical indicator and my biological indicator, it's going to show a positive. And here I use the changing color just to represent, but today the biological indicators, you do the uh, uh, the fast incubation, you do the readout in the incubator, you're going to see it, the positive or negative on the incubator, but just as here is just to represent uh, this lecture. So if I have air in there, my BI is going to show a positive growth. If I have a chemical indicator, it's going to show a failed cycle. And if I do not have air, everything is going to be approved. So this is how I measure non-condensed gases. Now, let's look into um, the saturation of the steam, the energy, right? How do I determine that my energy is being transferred? And I call that in dryness, but this is where we have to look into the sterilization cycle. For us to have uh, the sterilization occurring, we need to have here, we need to be here at point C. We need to have the steam at the almost 100% gauges, because don't remember, uh, don't forget that the standard requires 97% of dryness, so 3% of water. So this is where we need to be during the sterilization cycle. To measure that, uh, to, for us to have latent heat and to be able to uh, coagulate spores and inactivate them, we need to have this point during the whole cycle, during this, the whole exposure phase. Unfortunately, the equipment cannot measure, cannot determine during the cycle if they are at point B, where I have a lot of water in the steam, or at point C. Nor if I uh, if I have oops, if I have superheated steam, so the equipment cannot measure this. What do we that, what do we do we use as a monitoring device to determine that we are at the ideal point to promote the coagulation of the spores and an activation of them? Biological indicators. So the biological indicators are today the only. Uh, process indicator, quality process indicators that are capable to detect superheat, superheated steam. Why, why, why superheated steam is an issue? If you recall, for those that started sterilization many years ago, we started doing sterilization uh, with dry heat. And sterilization at that time 
had a higher temperature, higher than 270, and a longer exposure phase over four hours, two to four hours. In our sterilizations today that we have with steam, we do it at lower temperature than dry heat, 275 uh, Fahrenheit, for three minutes. So if I have superheated steam, in three minutes, I will not be able to coagulate the spores inside of the biological indicator. And I will not be able to reach the 12 log reduction that I said at the beginning of this uh, webinar as a requirement to clear my load. So BIs are the only ones that can measure superheat. And also BIs are able to monitor if I don't have the correct dryness in the chamber. If I have a steam that is too wet, I will be in this position here and the BI will not approve in, th in three minutes exposure. So BIs with a PCD are capable to detect the other variables that are not measured by our equipment today. So we have time and temperature by the equipment, non-condensal gases and steam dryers with a PCD with a biological indicator. That is why it is important to have BIs on every load monitoring. We are not monitoring the load, we are monitoring the cycle. We are making sure that the cycle that my devices are being exposed to has the correct quality to promote sterilization. Now let's look into uh, chemical indicators and their performance. I also did another research on chemical indicators. And uh, if you go into YouTube, into the, uh, Google, you're going to see a lot of uh, weird testing done with chemical indicators, um, people using iron, people uh, blow drying a uh, um, CI uh, chemical indicator, or even putting in those uh, ovens at home to show that uh, those CIs do not work. And this is not a correct way to test a CI. So. Uh, uh, I didn't look into what they were doing as a testing process. I was concerned on the motivation for those testing. So let's look into the performance of um, the CIs, uh, chemical indicators. So as you know, biologic indicators, they have uh, the capability to monitor six log reductions. Plus, non-condensal gases and superheated steam. So biological indicators, they are the guy, right? They are really the indicators that we have today. But we have also chemical indicators that are good that we place in our load because we can have that being um, looked at it after sterilization, after sending the package to the uh, um, surgical suite. So what we have uh, to mimic the performance of a biological indicator, we have uh, type 5 chemical indicators that are integrators and they are capable of integrating uh, a reduction of 11 to 12 logs uh, in the sterilization cycle. So we use BI for the steam quality and we use the uh, type 5 for uh, the 12 log evidence in the sterilization. There are some other indicators. Um, Type six, which are indicators that only they are only supposed to turn on a specific time and temperature, but uh, their performance it's impacted a lot in our sterilizer. They work marvelous in the testing equipment, and I'm going to show you in a, a little bit. But when we use them in our uh, normally day-to-day -day, uh, sterilizer, uh, they do not have the same performance. But type five, which is an integrator can be used in any temperature because it's going to be integrated during the cycle. So what I learned from 
chemical indicators. Well, first, chemical indicators, they are tested in a vessel called beer vessel. If I had an E, it would be fun, but it's an I, so it's a biological indicator, equipment, physiotomy. So chemical indicators are tested in a vessel that was initially developed for biological indicators. Let's look into this vessel. This vessel has, it's a little bit different from our day-to-day uh, -day sterilizer. It does one vacuum point and it goes from this lower, the lowest point, vacuum point, to the exposure in 10 seconds. Then it has a very strict exposure time and then a very fast air removal or drying phase. Air removal, no, steam removal and drying phase. So for BIs, it works really good because BIs, we want to challenge them at the exposure phase. So we, we want to eliminate as max, as maximum as you want all the pre and post stuff. But for CIs, it's a bit complicated. Let's look into the graph. So I did uh, a research using uh, only type five and type six chemical indicators. And um, here is the actual beer vessel graph. So here we have uh, the 10 second come up curve. So it goes from the deepest vacuum point to the exposure phase in 10 seconds. And then I added a two minute exposure. So the two minute exposure at 275 needs to give me a failed. So I had uh, some failed, some pass, and this was caused by the, um, I'm sorry, I had failed for the type five, some pass because the type five is an integrator. So we have a limit in there that can pass. And type six, I had some failed and some pass, which is totally against the specification of uh, the type six. The type five, it is in the acceptable range. Some positive, some passing, some fail. Now, with four minute exposure, I had all of them, um, if a, uh, the 10 second uh, curve, I had them showing pass and pass and fail uh, for three minutes and for four minutes pass, the type six. Let's look back into that graph. I made a mistake. Let me correct again. Let's go into the first one. Let's look into the graph. Sorry. So, 10 seconds, come up curve, two minute exposure. So we are looking to this line here only, not the other ones. So for the two minutes, we had CIs type five failing and type six failing. Okay, now, for the 10 second come up curve and four minute exposure. So we are looking to the three here, right? Four minute exposure. I had nine pass the type five and nine pass the type six. So what I'm showing to you, and this is why I had this, this article has a lot of data and I try to concentrate everything in a way that you guys would see it, is that for the, when you are using the 10 second come up curve, the CIs are working according to standard. Now, if we add, remember that I mentioned the three minute come up curve for the buoy deck, the same thing applies here and this is the most common come up curve that we see today out of those 90 plus sterilizers that I work with, that I measure. So now the come up curve has three minutes. So I'm starting here. Uh, so this is the last vacuum point, And then the exposure starts here. So for this situation, with a three minute exposure, we are here. I had my type five showing pass for a three minute exposure. And this is because it integrated some of that lethality during the come up. But type six showed 
or approved. And if I reduce the time, the exposure time to two minutes, I'll start seeing some failed detected by type five, but type six cannot detect it. And what we have in the Boy deck is a type, it's a similar to type six. So as you can see, the type, the, the chemical indicator will have a different behavior because of the come up curve that is not present when they are challenged by the manufacturer according to standards. Now let's look into the PCD result versus the load release. When I place correctly by PCD inside of my chamber, I will be not monitoring what I have in my load with the PCD, but I will be monitoring the steam quality. I'm going to be monitoring those variables that my printout cannot capture. So when I have a approved PCD, does not mean that the temperature was reached inside of my containers, for instance. I might have a type five inside of the container showing a failed result. So even though the PCD showed you that the variables are okay, the cycle was okay, if I see a type five inside of my load showing a failed cycle, that tells me that even though I had the correct sterling, the correct time, the correct temperature, I was not able to reach those parameters inside of my package. Therefore, the package was either too heavy, not well assembled, the, best, the sterile barrier was not well closed or um, you know, put together, and I cannot use that. So it's normal for you to see. Uh, it's, it's a normal situation. You should consider that the, 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 the information from that type six, that type five, as a, a adequate information that my load did not reach the temperature inside, even though everything is showing approved. Uh, and this is, I'm saying this because uh, I normally hear uh, people, uh, users saying that, well, everything approved, all my CIs, everything that I had in my load showed, this one showed approved, this showed approved, this showed approved, this showed approved, this showed approved, the PCD showed approved, but this one failed. So I guess the type five in this one here uh, was defective. It wasn't. It was telling you that that container had a problem, okay? So this is how I should use my PCDs in reference to my load and the CIs inside of my load. Now, I have to be careful when I use my PCDs and how I prepare my load. PCDs cannot do magic. PCD placed in a load like this is going to show you a approved cycle. It's going to show you approved cycle. Because PCD cannot detect if the load was assembled correctly. Now, I have a, a space problem in my autoclave. So I have to put my PCD. So I try, I put it standing up like that. That's not even accurate how to use it. You have to follow the manufacturing instruction for using how to place your PCD. Then you have wet packs. PCDs cannot detect wet packs. And normally wet packs are related to excessive load. If I have too much weight, or if I have non-metallic devices, my, I will have wet packs, even if my PCD showed approved results and my uh, printout showed approved results, everything is showing approved, but I have a wet pack. Those devices cannot detect uh, that, that situation. So, in summary, for my cycle monitoring, I will use the buoy deck to monitor the conditioning phase and exposure phase. My BIs and CIs inside of a process challenge device, I use to monitor 
the exposure phase. And the printout is going to give me the whole summary of the cycle. So what I will do, I would compare the results of the buoy deck with the printout. They have to be, both have to approve the cycle. If one failed, then the whole cycle failed. So if the buoy deck failed, the cycle is a, it's a fail. If the physical indicator failed, the cycle is a fail. For the exposure phase, I will also compare if I had a good buoy deck. That's why the buoy deck has to be run daily. And then at the exposure phase, I have to have time and temperature with the um, variance that is standardized, cannot be have a, a, a large variance in temperature. And I will compare the BIs and CIs. If one of them failed, if one of them failed, the whole cycle failed. So if I have a CI showing a failed, the whole cycle is failed, even if the other ones are showing approved. For me to approve a cycle, I have to have all indicators approving the cycle. Okay? I, um, here are some of the references that I use for this presentation. Some of my articles are here also. And now we can go to the uh, Q&A. Awesome. Thank you for the great presentation, Paulo. Uh, this concludes the educational portion of the webinar, and we will now move in to answer some of your questions that came through during the presentation. Uh, so let's do it. All right. Um, the first one, let me sh share here. What is the scope of the new 11140 part one publication and how is the interpretation of PCDs in this new publication? So the 11140-1 was um, recently revised. Uh, there isn't any change that will create a huge impact. Um, you have the performance and all the testing listed there, and then you have the other parts specific for each type of uh, chemical indicator that each manufacturer should, should use to test their chemical indicators before releasing to the market. It is important to note that that standard, the 11140 and series one through uh, five, uh, one through six, are not meant for end users. Those are standards specific for manufacturers of uh, chemical indicators. If you, as an end user, wants to use a standard, there is a specific standard for end users to choose and use chemical indicators. Um, oof, my memory sometimes fails me, but uh, let's keep on on the questions and I will try to search here, but uh, which standard is it? So we don't lose time when I search the standard. Go ahead uh, for the next question, and then I come back with that standard, uh, Fernando. No worries. Thank you so much, Paulo. I have a uh, other question from the audience. Um, I have a negative BI on a aborted cycle that was a temperature for two minutes. Why? She had a negative BI? Yes, a negative BI. Yes. So uh, this is something that we always see and people question uh, that the performance of the BI. Like I explained during the presentation, uh, BIs are only capable to monitor six log reductions. Six log reduction in a cycle that has uh, 270 Fahrenheit for four minutes that six log reduction will occur during the first minute, minute and a half. So we are always going to see a BI showing a negative on a spore growth uh, if a shorter exposure time. So BIs, they do not monitor exposure time, they monitor steam quality. 
So you're always going to have the eyes showing negative in the cycles that are less than four minutes because they only have one meter viable spores. You can only measure a six log reduction with the eyes. So that's expected to see, okay? Perfect, thank you, Dr. Langera. Next question. What happens when a chemical indicator is showing a passing result but months later, after storing the chemical indicator, sometimes coloration begins to refer back to its original color. <laughs> That's, uh, I have a joke with that. Those are reusable chemical indicators. No. <laughs> so what happened is that uh, uh, the chemistry behind the chemical indicator reacts um, or has a inversion when it is stored at ambient temperature. It reacts back to the initial color. So for chemical indicators, you need to do the interpretation immediately after the cycle, and you have to register uh, your result, pass or fail manually because of that, because the, uh, uh, depending on the manufacturer of the chemical indicator, you're going to have that situation where uh, the color uh, reacts back to its original state. By the way, the standard for chemical indicators uh, users, if you want to follow a standard, it's ISO 15882. Awesome. Can you repeat, Paulo, for our audience? The ISO for the end user, it's eyes for chemical indicators, it's ISO 15882. Awesome. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, mm -hmm. And probably our last question, um, generally, are the chemical indicators reliable? Yes, yes. I, I like to work, especially type 5. Um, so like I showed you, in a, uh, in a beer vessel, all chemical indicators for, uh, work marvelously. But in hospital sterilizers, we have, if we have the correct cycle, the correct come up curve, type 5 chemical indicators are uh, ideal to be used. And I do trust the results that they present uh, at the end of the cycle. In addition to the PCD and the boy dig and the physical indicators. So it, it, you never can use one indicator by itself. You have to use the sum of all the indicators that I have available today to release my load. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paulo. Uh, we don't have more time for questions. Uh, we hope you had a good time with us today. And for more 3M sterilization and cleaning monitoring education, we invite you to visit Stereo, powered by 3M Healthcare Academy. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, everybody.